Welcome to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan. My name is Michael Penn. I'm the secretary of the club, and I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, today, we are going to be discussing one of the biggest uh, international issues running for quite some time, and that, of course, is the uh, Iranian nuclear issue. Uh, and, of course, uh, we're going to relate this issue to Japan. Uh, I'm sure you all know that Japan has been one of the biggest customer uh, for uh, Iranian energy exports for a long time. Uh, we have two very distinguished and knowledgeable guests who are going to uh, inform our discussions. Uh, they'll be speaking for about 30 minutes, and then we'll have about 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, sitting directly next to me here is uh, Professor William Beeman of the University of Minnesota, uh, a longtime uh, expert on, on these issues, and uh, he's currently visiting Japan. And while he was visiting Japan, we grabbed him and uh, brought him here to the Foreign Correspondence Club of Japan because it's a good opportunity for us to learn more. And uh, on the uh, further side uh, is, uh, is another uh, one of Japan's top experts on the Iran issues. Uh, his, he is Koichiro Tanaka, Managing Director of the Institute of Energy Economics Japan uh, and involved in energy issues and Iran issues on a daily basis. So, uh, and obviously he's very well informed on uh, Japanese policy and uh, what the Japanese government has been doing as well. The order of our presentations will be Professor Beeman first and then uh, Mr. Tanaka second. And we'll just jump right into it. And when we get to the Q&A, uh, you can all uh, find out what you want to know. Uh, just one little housekeeping issue. If you have a Keitai Denwa, a phone of some kind or something that makes noise, Including please me. put it on. Uh, yes, that sometimes <laughs> it's us too. Uh, please put it on manner mode uh, so that uh, we don't get any strange beeps and noises when we should be listening to what these guys have to say. Mode. All right, so well, Professor Beeman, you're up. Thank you very much. I'm especially pleased to be here uh, today. I was actually a member of this club uh, in 1982 and 1983. Uh, and uh, so it is a, a special pleasure for me to be back with you today. Um, I'll use the microphone. There, is that better for everyone? Yes. Sir. All right. Audio. Oh, I see for the audio there. Um, I want to uh, go through a, a lot of uh, points about the Iranian program. I'm sure that there'll be some overlap in our presentation since uh, 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 Tanaka-san is, uh, is very knowledgeable about these things and we have been in touch with each other for many years. Uh, first of all, some basic facts about the, uh, the P5 plus 1 talks with Iran in Vienna. Uh, the talks were agreed upon in 2013. They allow a six-month period of negotiations uh, that will be up in July. Uh, and the, uh, the point of the negotiations is to assure uh, the nations of the world, as represented by the P5 plus 1 nations and other signatories to the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, that Iran is not uh, is not building a nuclear weapon. Uh, so in recognition for uh, participation in these talks, a small, some small concessions have been made to Iran, including a lifting of some restrictions on their uh, financial affairs. Uh, and it's presumed, by Iran anyway, uh, that's not quite clear for the rest of the world, that if the negotiations are successful, most or all of the financial sanctions will be, list will be lifted and that Iran will be free to conduct its uh, nuclear program without um, without uh, uh, interference from the rest of the world, except for the provisions that are listed in the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Now, this comes to uh, the the first uh, point that we need to try to emphasize is that the the talks are taking place within the framework of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. I'll refer to that and during the the rest of the talk as the NPT because it will save time. But the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty is, uh, is uh, a, a document that the Iranians are very, very, um, find very important in framing these talks, and they are quite wary of, uh, of exceeding the bounds of the provisions of the NPT. Uh, so the issues that are at stake <coughs> in Vienna, first of all, is the question of uh, Iran's enrichment of uranium to 20% concentration or greater. 
the second is the development of a nuclear, uh, heavy water nuclear reactor in Iraq that could produce weaponi weaponizable plutonium. Uh, third, the building, uh, continued building and operation of centrifuges for enriching uranium. And fourth, the inspection of sites in Iran that might be used for nuclear weapons development. All of these things are being discussed. Now, uh, there has been some concrete progress as far as I can discern, and you may, you know, you may have some, uh, some better insights into this being closer to the negotiations. Iran has converted most of its 20 percent uranium to oxidized plates for use in a research reactor. That's why they enriched the uranium to 20 percent to begin with. Uh, and uranium in this form cannot be weaponized. So this particular issue has, uh, by, for all intents and purposes, already been resolved by Iran. Second, the, Iran has agreed to modify the design of the Iraq reactor so that its output would be much more difficult to be weaponized. So this has, uh, this has um, also uh, been a, a matter for progress. Now, as a result of optimism about, the, uh, about this progress, uh, business representatives from around the world have flooded Tehran. There are thousands of business uh, members from uh, Europe, from Japan, undoubtedly. Uh, and, <laughs> and ch uh, of course, China was already involved with Iran, and also from the United States. Uh, so we have many, many U.S. businessmen that are anticipating a conclusion, a positive conclusion to these results. They are eager and, uh, to resume business relations with Iran. And this is putting pressure on the U.S. government and on other governments uh, that, are, uh, that uh, may be skeptical about the results. There are still issues to be resolved. Uh, Iran is not willing to allow wholesale inspection of its military and industrial sites, those in military and industrial sites that do not contain fissile material or will not contain fissile material within uh, the next 180 days as outlined by the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. Uh, in order to do that, Iran has uh, said informally that this would be to allow, uh, the, allow the other nations of the world to effectively occupy Iran uh, and to, uh, uh, to have unrestricted access to every military or industrial site in the country, theoretically. Uh, so this is, a, uh, this is a matter that Iran is not willing to concede, and that's a matter for discussion right now. Fine, uh, finally, Iran will not give up the right to enrich uranium, uh, which is a right that is, that is guaranteed to them under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. And this has, been, uh, also, uh, uh, this has also been ratified by President Gerald Ford. In 1975, President Ford uh, ex issued an executive order saying that Iran had the right to enrich uranium at that time. This is a fact that is not often repeated by the U.S. government in particular, but it is, in fact, a, uh, it is, in fact, a written fact. It is a, a written executive order. One could say that the order has been contramanded by subsequent administrations, but uh, Iran has had the right uh, to enrich uranium since 1975, and the NPT gives them that right. So these are, there are a number of things that are, that are going to, uh, that are working to impede this agreement between Iran and the P5 plus one nations. First and foremost are demands on Iran that go beyond the requirements of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. And the first of these is the, uh, is the inspection, the unrestricted inspection uh, of uh, Iran's nuclear, uh, Iran's, sorry, uh, military and industrial sites uh, and or the elimination of such sites uh, in the future. And second, demands that Iran stop uh, enriching uranium altogether. Uh, other um, people who are outside of these negotiations want to see Iran's nuclear uh, program completely and totally dismantled. And this is out completely outside of the framework of the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty, which grants in its fourth, uh, uh, in its fourth uh, provision, in its fourth article, grants all nations the inalienable right to use nuclear technology for peaceful purposes. This is a, this is a guaranteed right to all signatories of the treaty. Uh, there are issues that are uh, also extraneous to the question of whether Iran's, nu of Iran's nuclear program under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. This is, first of all, uh, 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 the accusation of Iran's purported threats to Israel, not, not included under the treaty, not included under the, uh, under the protocols for the talks. 
Iran's human rights record, which is oftentimes brought up, uh, and Iran's need for nuclear power. People say, well, Iran doesn't need nuclear power because it has other kinds of petroleum resources. This is irrelevant uh, because uh, Iran is nevertheless guaranteed the right to nuclear technology under the NPT. Whether its uh, energy needs are uh, there or not is, is a, a complete irrelevancy to these talks. Uh, now, there are misconceptions that keep these extraneous issues alive. First of all, there is a continued insistence that Iran actually has a nuclear weapons program. There is no evidence anywhere from any intelligence agency on the planet at all that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. And every single report from the, uh, the International Atomic Energy Agency every single quarter uh, may uh, raise suspicions about Iran's program. They always conclude with the fact that Iran has not diverted any fissile material, any nuclear material, for any weapons purpose. That's in every single report of the IAEA, whatever else the report may say. And the United States uh, intelligence, uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence estimate 2007, and again in 2011, these are not normally released, but these two uh, uh, were released, say that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. Furthermore, the last four uh, directors of uh, the Israeli intelligence agency, Mossad, also agree that Iran does not have a nuclear weapons program. Uh, now, we continue to hear that it does uh, from the press, you, not you gentlemen, perhaps, or ladies, perhaps, but we do hear from the world press, people blithely talk about the, the Iranian nuclear weapons program. There is no evidence that such a program exists. And I want to emphasize that very clearly. The second is the, uh, the concept, since the, you can't say that the program exists, there is a, uh, a concept of breakout capacity. That is, well, if Iran doesn't have a weapons program, then they could break out and develop one very quickly, within a year. The first time this was stated was in 1991. Um, yeah, by um, in uh, uh, by the uh, the CIA, they said Iran is two years away from developing a nuclear weapon. That was 1991, uh, and uh, we, the, this continues down to the present day, where people blithely will say Iran is a year away. Iran is two years away from developing a nuclear weapon. It has not happened, uh, and not only that, but Iran, I will tell you, is technologically incapable of of, of any sort of breakout capacity within that short period of time especially since their 20% uranium has now been converted to a non-military uh, non, uh, uh, non uh, purpose. The third is that Iran, uh, the assertion that Iran cheated in the past and will do so in the future. This is simply, flatly, completely untrue. The only, play, the only time that Iran has ever, quote, cheated, unquote, was when they missed a reporting deadline in 2005 by a week uh, for uh, the introduction of fissile material into a uh, into a, a, a nuclear a facility, an enrichment facility. So this is a this is a uh, this is a flat out untruth uh, that has uh, been widely promulgated. But it uh, is one of the things that that impedes these discussions. The idea that Iran is a direct threat to Israel. I am so tired of refuting the the very uh, ridiculous mistranslation of a minor event uh, in 2005. Uh, which said that Iran, Iran, quote unquote, uh, has threatened to quote wipe Israel off of the map. It never happened. It is a complete lie, a total mistranslation, and it has been widely promulgated and used uh, in order to undermine these talks. And so it is. Uh, it's very frustrating for those of us who actually know Persian, who actually know what the, what what uh, finally happened, what happened there, to see this uh, this mistranslation. Uh, actually uh, being used uh, again and again uh, in this situation. The idea that, uh, that the pressure to sanctions has brought Iran to the table, and so more pressure will yield more concessions uh, to Iran is something that's widely uh, said in the United States. Uh, it's certainly true that Iran would like to see the sanctions lifted, but uh, anybody who's been to Iran knows that Iran is self-sufficient now in just about everything. There is, uh, there are certain, uh, the, the economy, uh, in, insofar as it depends on the, on foreign uh, exchange, uh, is, uh, is indeed um, uh, a suffering to a degree. There, but uh, building materials, industrial materials, anything that Iran needs to conduct normal business is, now exists internally in Iran. Uh, the idea that, uh, that uh, economic uh, sanctions have 
brought Iran to its knees is a fantasy on the part of uh, those who really don't know the internal situation in Iran. Now, finally, there's the, the desire to crush and humiliate Iran. I don't even need to mention this uh, because it is so uh, unworthy of real negotiations, but there are people who really want that to happen. They want to see Iran destroyed. Uh, and they are uh, they're pressuring for uh, sanctions for um, uh, events that will actually do that. And the desire to affect regime change in Iran. This is a long-standing desire on the part of neoconservatives in the United States. They've stated it explicitly. They've been stating it since the mid-1990s. And it's still alive in U.S. foreign policy, maybe not so much in European foreign policy. So these are contrasting goals that Iran and the United States have. The United States wants to win uh, the, the negotiations by, uh, by crushing Iran to dismantle, or the right wing in the United States, to dismantle Iran's nuclear program and to install a permanent inspection regime. That would be the goal of the most extreme right wing politicians in the United States and some in Europe as well. Iran wants to exercise its rights as uh, defined under the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty to continue to enrich uranium, to continue to develop its nuclear energy program with additional uh, nuclear reactors. By, by the way, the program was started 40 years ago at the instigation of the United States. And the United States sat down with the Shah and planned 14 nuclear energy uh, reactors at that time in the 1970s. Uh, and tried very hard, the United States tried very hard to sell those nuclear reactors to Iran uh, from Westinghouse, General Electric, and so forth. And they'd like to have the current economic sanctions lifted, lifted, lifted of course. Now, I, this is, uh, if, if, there's a, if I have a main point for my Japanese uh, audience, it's the first one here. Since Japan is a non-nuclear weapons uh, in, uh, nu uh, uh, signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which enriches uranium, any restriction on Iran's right to enrich uranium sets a precedent that could be used against Japan in the future. It's a very important point that is all that is ignored. That we don't. We, this would be Iran would be the first signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty that is being forced to abrogate its rights under the treaty to enrich uranium. It's being specifically targeted. Japan is one of 19 nations that enriches uranium but does not have nuclear weapons. So if, Iran's, if Iran is forced to do this, then who knows who could be next? Brazil, Argentina, uh, you know, certainly, uh, uh, certainly several European nations. But Japan is definitely put on notice that if it happened to Iran, it can happen to Japan. Uh, and I would go on, to, go on further to say that, in, uh, that there have been officials in Japan who've said that Japan, in fact, is ready and able to make nuclear weapons if it, the need be in order to, uh, to uh, undergo Japanese defense. So in, in some ways, Iran is, uh, sorry, Japan is much further in, uh, along in its, um, in its progress toward the manufacture of nuclear weapons than Iran. Now, Japan is, of course, a major importer of Middle East oil. I'm sure Mr. Tanaka will talk about this. And renewed ties, now, the, I'm talking about the negative aspects. The positive aspects are renewed ties with Iran as a result of these negotiations would greatly, greatly aid the Japanese economy, both in terms of oil supply and in terms of economic exchange. The positive benefits are huge. Uh, it would transform the world. It would be as important, in my estimation, as the US opening to China under the Nixon regime. And if, the, uh, if that were to happen, we would see a worldwide economic boom fueled by this agreement alone. Finally, reduced tension in the Middle East would, of course, uh, be of economic and political and cultural benefit to Japan. This is my last slide. Japan can help. First of all, Jan, uh, Japan is in the, uh, the unique position to serve as an informal mediator if it has the courage to do so. It's friendly both with Iran and with the P5 plus one nations. Japan can assure both Iran and, the, uh, the, and Japan's P5 plus one partners that it favors a positive outcome for these agreements. Now, a positive outcome is one that everybody agrees on, of course. Uh, but the, the positive outcome means that the agreements don't break down. So uh, for uh, Japan expressing its, the Japanese government expressing its desire to see the conclusions uh, succeed 
is a, a very important thing, even though it's not taking sides in the negotiations. Japan can emphasize that the parameters of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty are the only legitimate framework for, the, for negotiations to the exclusion of extraneous issues of, uh, that I've mentioned. Japan can keep uh, friendly communication lines open with all parties, can provide assurances that it supports peace and security for all nations in the Middle East, and can insist on truthful rep rep representation of Iran's energy program and its relations with other, natures, uh, other nations. And I thought I would give you four important books that emphasize the points that I made here. A uh, new one by Gareth Porter called Manufactured Crisis, the Untold uh, Story of the Iran Nuclear Scare. Uh, Peter Oborn, the great award-winning journalist from uh, the United Kingdom, A Dangerous Delusion, Why the West is Wrong About Nuclear Iran. My own book, The Great Satan Versus the Mad Mullahs, How the United States and Iran Demonize Each Other. And a very, very um, uh, interesting and important book called The American Reconst uh, Rhetorical Construction of the Iranian Nuclear Threat by Jason Jones. So thank you very much. I'm sorry there was a lot of content here, and I did go over by several minutes, but I uh, appreciate your attention. Okay, he did go over by several minutes, but I thought it was well worth it because his presentation was very clear and to the point. So I think it gives us a good basis for discussions. Uh, let's move on to... Uh, Mr. Koichiro Tanaka, and I believe he'll be talking more specifically about some of the Japanese issues as well as probably the energy issues. Right. Oh. Um, well, thank you. I'm very delighted to be here today. And first of all, I'm honored to talk along with uh, Professor Beeman. Uh, as am I. <laughs> We've seen each other for a very long time. Um, right now, uh, Professor Beeman has uh, illustrated most of the issues I think that is relevant to what we need to discuss here today. So I may skip some of the slides, but basically I wanted to try to uh, explain to you what has happened for over the past year or so, ever since the uh, Iranian presidential election in 2013. And then what is going inside, what is happening inside in Iran, the politics, the power politics, that changes the dynamics of the nuclear negotiations. But the, at the same time, we are seeing the difficulties of the negotiating team, both parties, I mean, at the uh, at Vienna, uh, where uh, the uh, talks are now conducted, and at last, I would like to turn your attention to the Japan-Iranian relationship in the eyes of the Americans, or the some uh, sort of a guidance interference slash everything uh, that has uh, made our relationship with uh, Iran very difficult to conduct, and uh, what Japan can do uh, with the current condition and where are we, uh, what we uh, what we we be uh, aiming for. Now, uh, the first slide would just uh, touch upon the, uh, I will give you an idea of what has happened during the past year. Now, uh, the minute maximum compromise that has happened so far was the interim agreement that was reached upon by the parties in November 2013. But as uh, Professor Beeman has stated, uh, it is quite true to say that the achievement for Iran, for the, for, in the eyes of the Iranians, was minimum. Uh, they got a very uh, limited temporary sanctions relief, which hasn't gotten themselves to anywhere. And there are active spoilers, both internal and external. And the bottom line for the uh, long term, uh, to, uh, to reach a comprehensive long term agreement is going to be hectic, and it's very difficult to remove all the sanctions in the short term. And th at least we can now be relieved to see that there is a very, uh, there is not an uh, appetite or any ex excuse to go for war, which was quite uh, vocal in the days when we were discussing about Iran back in 2008 and 9. And, uh, well, of course, Iran would like to resume and uh, reclaim its uh, position as a major exporter of oil to the uh, world and also to Japan, but it's still fanciful to uh, see that it's going to happen anytime soon. And that is the reality. Now, uh, the discussions in Vienna, which Professor Beeman has already illustrated, are evolving on these very touchy issues. The level of enrichment, scale of enrichment, fate of the IR-40, which is the Iraq heavy water research reactor, all has once been dealt with under the current interim agreement. But when the uh, issue is, that, that now these all these issue, touchy issues are again brought back on the table uh, to make this uh, long-term uh, comprehensive deal 
uh, to, to be signed. And that is not going to be easy because it's going to be a long term. And since during the interim agreement, the Iranians have given up so much, this time they would want to see more or at least consolidate their uh, positions and would not lean so much, uh, would not uh, make a major compromise, which would make the negotiating team very unhappy, uh, very unpopular back at home. And so uh, the president, uh, Rouhani, current president uh, Hassan Rouhani, was state, has stated uh, extremely clearly that uh, he would say no to a nuclear discrimination. He also used the phrase of apartheid uh, in this regard. And he means that he would not uh, relinquish the given right under the NPT. So uh, that is to say that it's already complicated and very difficult to solve. Then there are additional agendas or issues that have been, say, uh, tried by some uh, states to be included or in the uh, comprehensive uh, agreement. And these are the IB, IRBM developments which could threaten the uh, Israelis, the security of the Israelis, and there are Issues related to the Gulf states, which is called the state-sponsored terrorism, like Hezbollah, and so on and so forth. And also there's the internal issue of the uh, human rights violations. And also there, uh, the other uh, issue that it hasn't been, uh, say, reached, uh, that hasn't been solved so far, is how long would this long-term agreement last for? Now, the interim agreement is only for six months, renewable if the body is agreed to for another six months. But uh, this... The next one is supposed to be, the one that is under discussion is supposed to be for a long term, but it hasn't been stated for how long, how many years, how many decades. Um, if there's going to be a certain condition put upon uh, Iran to curtail, the, uh, curtail either their rights or the nuclear development, then Iran would want to see the terms not extending, uh, not, that would not exceed more than three or five years. But on the other side, the Europeans, the Americans would want to have sort of a long-term agreement, meaning that they can be quite satisfied and also, um, say, rest easily, seeing that Iran would not be uh, causing a major threat to the international security and also that their activities would be limited in, at a certain uh, grade and degree. Now, uh, there are domestic op opposition inside Iran, which I believe you may have heard or read somewhere, is that there is an emergence of the con so-called concerned citizens. In Farsi, you call that uh, del pa pas, and you have the verb, so uh, we are meaning, del pa, del pa pasi means that uh, we are concerned. And these people are concerned about that. Uh, what uh, concerned about that? The nucle nuclear negotiating team, read, uh, led by uh, Foreign Minister uh, Zarif, uh, has been giving away too many concessions. Uh, they've been compromising too much of the uh, right, Iranian right, and then uh, in return, the economy hasn't been, uh, say, re reviving as it was supposed to. And that now the human, even the human rights issues are exploited when uh, Catherine Ashton, the EU high representative, visit Tehran, that she uh, met some of the uh, Iranian so-called human rights activists, which caused a huge uh, fuss in Tehran. Now, uh, the other part of the problem is, or I would say the concern, is that uh, the supreme leader, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei, is pos his position is not that so, say, solid. Uh, he did mention last year that he would allow the negotiating team to show a heroical leniency or a uh, softness to the other side in order to promote talks. And he has said repeatedly that he is not, he is not against negotiations. But from the beginning, like in uh, September 2013, he has stated that he is not optimistic about the negotiations. But uh, during September up until, say, uh, January 2014, he was always talking about his, uh, the negotiations between Iran and the United States. He was said that he would not, and he is not, and would not be optimistic about negotiations with the United States. But in February 2014 and onwards, he has slightly changed the phrasing, and he is saying today that he is not optimistic about the nuclear issues or the nuclear negotiations. So he's shifting 
from the, his original point or position where he was more, say, um, supportive of the negotiations and the negotiating team under uh, Foreign Minister Zarif to a position that he is now, say, seeing that there may be some backlashes that he, that would compromise his position as the supreme leader if the talks are to fail. And then you see Ahmadinejad, the former president, is back close to the uh, supreme leader. Uh, you may recognize him. Uh, well, uh, the, the chap in the center, uh, the gentleman in the center is the uh, is uh, Ayatollah Khamenei. And to his left, and uh, the second left, you see Ahmadinejad. Mm -hmm. you, he's back there. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine in after 2009 up until his very last days as president, in a second term, Mr. Ahmadinejad had a very difficult uh, relationship with the supreme leader and he was really say isolated and then driven far away from the leader but now he's back so that can tell that uh maybe the uh supreme leaders think uh considering some other options and that is very worrying but anyway uh, under the uh relationship that we've been so far having with iran uh in the past uh well, uh, Iran was one of the markets that we heavily invested, and it was sort of an indispensable supplier of energy to Japan. Uh, during the first oil crisis of 1973, in those days, Iran supplied roughly 50% of the oil to Japan. 50%, five zero. That's a huge number. But today, uh, it's less than 5%. So the position as a major supplier of oil to Japan that has diminished enormously. But still, Iran is one of the very few Middle Eastern countries, all the Gulf countries, that provides sort of a provision for upstream investment. Uh, Iran, Iraq, others, not so much. So uh, there is a chance, there is a uh, opening, and there are, say, opportunities that uh, Iran presents to in, in the eyes of the Japanese. And it also provides the potential, as a, uh, it could act as a potential gateway to Afghanistan and the Central Asian republics, which uh, is a landlocked country, as you understand. And, and Caspian oil. <laughs> ah, well. <laughs> sure. Sure, thanks. And, um, but even having that sort of a great relationship in the past and until today, there have been some ups and downs, and the downside was that uh, there have been several uh, incidents uh, during the past two decades where the United States government or the um, legislation had stepped in to uh, make our life very difficult. Uh, one example I can show you is the uh, soft uh, loans provided by the Japanese government to Iran to construct a uh, hydroelectric power plant in the uh, Khuzestan, province of Khuzestan, was terminated by the uh, pressure from the United States. Uh, and the project is now complete, but the soft loans were terminated in between, uh, in midway. And also, uh, you can talk about the targeted uh, U.S. sanctions uh, when the Japanese had to relinquish their right to uh, develop the Azadegan oil field, again in the province of Khuzestan. And the most recent uh, NDAA, the National uh, Defense Authorization Act, uh, Appropriation Act, uh, I believe NDAA, what, what does that stand for? National Defense um, Authorization, Authorization Act. Act. Authorization, Authorization, Authorization Act, Act. Act. right. That's correct. Uh, since 2012 has brought in the picture that uh, oil, uh, any country that is importing oil uh, from Iran uh, uh, then its uh, central bank could be uh, sanctioned by, uh, placed under sanctions by the United States. And also the uh, importation of petrochemical products and so on and so forth are now become very difficult. And uh, besides that, businesses, uh, businesses, I mean in the Japanese business community has shied away from doing business with Iran. The most relevant or the most important issue here is the financial institutions, the banks, commercial banks, uh, which have now shown their reluctance to go back into Iran to deal with Iran. Uh, they are very uh, cautious about dealing with Iran because they might be, say, caught one day uh, retrospectively, uh, even if today it's okay, if, even if today it's going to be uh, given a green light by the uh, Department of Treasury of the United States. So even uh, though under the provisions, 
even under the provisions of the most strict uh, existing uh, economic sanctions and financial sanctions against Iran, non-strategic essential goods of humanitarian nature was never targeted. But these today, even these items today, are very difficult to export to Iran, simply because the financial institutions are not working in that way. And there are other uh, businesses that had shied away because they risked uh, that the repetition of dealing with Iran would be, uh, become sort of a liability to them if they try to continue their activities in the American, uh, 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 in the United States. So uh, all these uh, combined, uh, this has made the Japanese um, conducting the day-to-day uh, day act, uh, day-to-day -day, um, trade with Iran uh, to the, its lowest point ever since I've recognized. Now, uh, still, I think there are several avenues that we can explore. Of course, that we have to uh, follow our national interests as well. Uh, we do talk highly about, uh, about the nuclear non-proliferation regime. And in this sense, we need to seek further clarifi uh, clarification from the Iranians. But also at the same time, we would like to provide more proper incentives, or sometimes disincentives for a resolution. And the security and stability of the region is very uh, extremely important to us, since uh, about roughly 90% of our oil still comes from the Middle East, or the uh, Persian Gulf region and roughly 30% of the LNG imported to Japan today, again, comes from the strait, uh, through the Strait of Hormoz, which is, again, sort of a strategic choke point. Uh, so uh, the extreme measures, meaning military uh, measures, uh, by any party are not welcomed by us. And to, uh, for not, uh, to avoid that to happen, uh, I think we need to have a sort of an even-handed foreign policy in order to help uh, diffuse the tension that may arise in the region. I may recall, or I like to draw your attention to the 1980s, 30 years ago, such a long time, uh, when Japan was conducting a shuttle diplomacy between Iraq and, uh, Iran and Iraq, which were in, at war in those days. And we had a very uh, firm policy of an even-handed uh, foreign policy. It was conducted under the Nakasone Premiership but uh, who, the gentleman who was the foreign minister in those days was Shintaro Abe, the father of the current prime minister of Japan. So he had a very good policy. He, he shuttled quite frequently to the states and tried to defuse the tension that, well, at, at least try to see, uh, broker a ceasefire between the two states. Now, uh, we also want, want to see the uh, economic opportunities uh, in our hands and we would like to certainly uh, see Iran, Iraq, and GCC provide that sort of a opportunity for the Japanese businesses. So in short, uh, I would like to conclude that um, there are very difficult uh, issues that we need to discuss about and that the negotiating teams or the negotiating uh, parties would have to deal with. Uh, and it's gonna be still a rough uh, month or two until the 20th of July would uh, approach. Uh, when it's when the first uh, six month period was going to uh, come to its end, but I do believe that there are say um, opportunities that uh, we could certainly count on and to explore. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well we'll move straight into the Q and A. Uh, the microphone is being set up over here by Mr. Tobari. You got it. All right. <laughs> and uh, when you're called on, please go to the microphone, give your name and affiliation, and ask your question. I'll try to get as many of you in as I can. I saw Rudolph here first. Thank you, Michael. I'm Rudolf Tenhout. I'm an international energy correspondent for European Energy Review and Energy Post. Um, well, as you, as Ms. I have a question for Mr. Tanak in the first place. Uh, as you are, of course, are very well aware of is uh, Iran's ambitious uh, program for the development of uh, nuclear energy. I understood from Mr. Beeman that in, in itself these negotiations between Iran and the West have nothing to do or should not have anything to do with the development of uh, Iran's nuclear uh, energy, energy. En energy plan. Um, how keen, Mr. Naga, how keen are the Japanese uh, government and Japanese companies to jump on that 
Iranian mm -hmm. uh, nuclear energy train, and what hurdles can they expect? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, well, thank you for your uh, question. I think it's a very important one because uh, I think it was our foreign minister who visited Tehran. And I think it uh, came out in the news later that uh, there were certain issues that had been discussed, and one was then the sort of a nuclear uh, cooperation between the two countries. Uh, to be clear, um, first of all, uh, I think uh, the normalization of the Iranian issue needs to come first. Uh, mean this means that uh, it has to be taken off the table from the Security Council. It has to be brought back into the scope of the IAEA, and the normalization of the uh, inspections should have to follow. And then, only then, the nuclear suppliers group, which uh, Japan is a sort of a uh, member to it, would have so, uh, to make a, build a consensus that it is okay for the uh, member states of the group to export uh, its technology to Iran. And then you will have to look into the individual uh, companies like Toshiba or Hitachi, uh, IHI, uh, Mitsubishi's, uh, heavy industries, uh, whoever wants to uh, uh, take, on to the, uh, take that um, opportunity uh, for their benefit. But then uh, you will face a lot of competition from the uh, Koreans, uh, from the Russians, from the French, and um, I will never know. But it's going to be take. It's going to be a very long shot, uh, even though the uh, government may have some sort of an idea uh, to move things forward in this uh, sense. Can I add something? The the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty protects the right of company of countries to export nuclear technology to any state that is not producing nuclear weapons. Technology transfer is guaranteed by the NPT. Next question. Professor Koyama. Uh, Takashi Koyama, freelance. You mentioned several problems. What is the biggest problem, um, uh, Professor Bleeman? And for Mr. Tanaka, are you going to stop development of the Russian Far East? You know the U.S. is calling for that. <laughs> I really do believe that the largest problem is the external pressure that's being put on negotiators from parties that are not at all, uh, that are not at all involved in the negotiations. This is a negotiation between P5, the P5 plus one nations and the United States, P5 plus one and, and Iran. And what we are, um, I don't want to be too negatively explicit, but the, one, the, the major parties that have a, a strong interest in this are Israel and, to a certain extent, Saudi Arabia. And the, uh, is, Israel, through, uh, uh, directly and also through its uh, supporters in the United States, have put tremendous pressure on the U.S. government uh, to, ex to exceed the scope of the uh, negotiations and bring extraneous matters into uh, the negotiations. Frankly, I think that many of these uh, parties would like to see the negotiations fail uh, by, uh, by placing such extreme demands on Iran that Iran will walk away. Then they can blame Iran for having scuttled the talks. But Iran is used to this. They are very smart. <laughs> they know uh, that uh, they're not going to allow this uh, kind of a scenario to happen. So, uh, for instance, the um, the uh, bringing uh, the conventional missile technology into the uh, into the negotiations is a really uh, a complete. It's completely extraneous to anything that could be negotiated under the the uh, under the nuclear nonproliferation treaty. And yet, uh, some people have raised it as a in in their scope. Uh, the, an American commentator, Kenneth Pollack, uh, on May sixth wrote an editorial for the uh, uh, New York Times which said that the inspections regime should extend to 50 years. Uh, and uh, this is a, an individual who was a, a member of the Department of, St uh, of uh, State under Madeleine Albright, and he does have the ear of uh, certain individuals. When you get statements like this, which is a completely unrealistic and in, uh, rather crazy statement, frankly, being published in our major newspaper as an, uh, as an opinion piece, then you know that uh, the kind of pressure that's being put on the U.S. government to, uh, to try to uh, exceed these, um, 
these negotiation uh, patterns. Well, um, I certainly get, didn't uh, get the gist of your questions, All right? Uh, you mentioned the Russians in the Far East. Sure. Uh, you have a huge investment project there? Uh, you meaning who? What? Uh, you mean the, the Russians? The, the Japanese. The Japanese? Yes. Okay. Right. You're and not aware of that? You, well, yes, well, we are aware of that, but. Uh, well, and the U.S. is asking you to stop that because of the Ukrainian issue. Oh. Yeah, but uh, the relevance of the question, I mean, uh, I'm sorry to ask that, but. Uh, We're supposed to talk about Iran. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, we can talk, discuss uh, some other time in some other occasions, right? All right. Well, I guess what he's saying is, is that he doesn't feel that this is related to the Iranian issue, which is the theme for today. Um, but I'm sure at another time he'll be happy to address sure. that. <laughs> sure. uh, I, I will say that almost that in the United States, almost everything relates to the Iranian issue. So that the, uh, the Iranians are being blamed for the Ukrainian situation too. It's crazy, but that happens in, in our U.S. press. If I can reframe his question in a way that might be answerable. Um, does the fact that Japan doesn't make full use of its ability to import oil from Iran mm -hmm. reduce its options when dealing with other countries, such as uh, um, this situation in, mm -hmm. in Siberia? I mean, does mm -hmm. it mean that Japan has to develop other mm -hmm. places because mm -hmm. it's not it's not taking its traditional amount of oil right, from Iran. Right, right. Well, uh, when it comes to oil, uh, there are abundance of uh, other suppliers. And also in the United States or the North American continent, you hear about the uh, light tight oil, or the so-called shale oil. So uh, there are, um, say, uh, resources that you can tap into. But when it comes to gas, especially when, it's come to, uh, when it comes to, comes to the form of the uh, gas to an LNG, then there are uh, limited numbers of suppliers or uh, alternatives that you can look into. Um, in this regard, unfortunately, Iran is not a LNG exporter, so we cannot see Iran's role oh, yes, as a, to China. They have no, been. no they, they are not an exporter of LNG. Iran is not. They, it, it does not have an LNG export facility, simply. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we cannot see the role of how uh, Iran, I mean, our relationship with Iran would uh, have an impact with whether or not we are going to continue or discontinue our activities in Russian Far East. Okay, uh, first, okay, I'll get back to you, but we have a question over here first. Yes, then I'll come to you second, then back to Rudolph. Uh, I'm Jacob Edelman, Bloomberg News' uh, question for Mr. Tanaka. Uh, I think you said that, uh, you know, uh, if there's a deal, um, sanctions are lifted, we wouldn't expect to see oil to uh, start being exported uh, in, the, in the near term. Um, why, why is that? What would be the holdup? Um, two issues, I think, you have to look into. One is that uh, the NDAA does not have the sort of a provision that the uh, United States president would uh, totally uh, abolish that clause that, that would pro pro uh, provide uh, that would uh, that would sanction the um, that would place sanctions uh, over foreign uh, central banks, and that is going to be still a sort of a matter that we need to discuss with Washington closely if there is going to be a major deal. The second issue is that uh, now today, the uh, not even for Japan, but for most countries, uh, I think, for, with the exception of China, uh, the role of uh, China and India possibly. The uh, role of uh, Iranian oil in its uh, market or the uh, energy uh, mixture is very low, has come to its very low lim uh, minimum. Uh, the European states hardly uh, have today uh, anything to do with the Iranian oil. So Iranians have to do a lot to regain that market. And it's not going to be easy because today there is no lack of oil in, uh, in its amount. So uh, these are the two factors that I think uh, you need to look into. Okay, this gentleman over here. Good evening. <clears throat> I'm Takechara from this club. I'm afraid you haven't, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Professor Abiman, 
and uh, Mr. Tanaka, thank you very much for your clear-cut statement of the position, Iranian positions. I'm afraid uh, you haven't touched touch upon, you haven't touched upon uh, Israel. And uh, my question is, with respect to uh, nuclear program development by Iranian, by Iranian uh, it seems to me there is a considerably big gap in perception uh, of uh, possible uh, fear or risk between United States and Israel, which takes a more stricter uh, view of this issue. So uh, I would like to invite your comments on this problem. Thank you. Um, I hadn't um, made Israel part of my presentation. It's almost a complete um, uh, presentation in and of itself, but I will make a few remarks. It's important for everyone to remind themselves that, new, that Israel is not a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. There are four major nations in the world that have nuclear energy, or nuclear uh, weapons, actually, that are not. Israel, Pakistan, India, and North Korea. North Korea withdrew from the treaty and then, uh, and then developed its uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, Israel, by all accounts, has something like 250 nuclear weapons ready to launch. Uh, the, I'm saying by some accounts because Israel does not officially acknowledge that they have these nuclear weapons, but it is an open secret that they do. Uh, the, at the same time, Israel uh, tells, is, has been telling the United States that if Iran uh, were to develop a bomb, uh, that, uh, it, that it would immediately launch it against Israel. Right now, Iran has enough 5% enriched uranium to make maybe two bombs, maybe. But in order to make those bombs, Iran would have to, first of all, enrich the uranium to 90%, 95% uh, 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 in order to weaponize it. They'd have to build a facility that would actually produce the weaponized uh, uranium. They would, have to produce, they would have to build a facility that would actually manufacture a bomb. They would have to develop a delivery system, a missile system that could actually deliver the bomb. And most importantly, they would have to test such a, uh, such a bomb in order to be able to use it. So if you have enough to make one bomb and you test it, then you have no bombs. And, and, there, and Iran, uh, Iran has not built any of these facilities that, I've that I'm telling you about. And so the, the, and not only that, but the International Atomic Energy Agency inspects every scrap, every speck of fissile material in, uh, in, uh, in Iran today. So Iran couldn't do such a thing without being detected. Uh, and so the, it, it, makes it, very, uh, makes it seem very disingenuous for Israel sitting there with 250 finished nuclear missiles ready to launch to say that Iran is a huge existential danger to Israel. Uh, and, uh, this is, uh, and because they're not a uh, signatory to the treaty, they have no place in Vienna. They could only try to influence the talks from, uh, through external forces. Now, I've been rather harsh, but you asked the question, so I did want to answer directly uh, uh, in, uh, in talking about this. But this is the, the situation that we, that we find ourselves in with regard to Israel. They're interlopers in the discussions, and their concerns are, frankly, um, uh, by people who are serious about the, the issue, they're not taken seriously. Right. Uh, from my point of view, I think I'd like to take, make two remarks. One is the position between Israel and uh, the United States. During the George W. Bush administration, the, the uh, position of the two countries, two states, was much, clo much closer. Uh, when George W. Bush was saying that he would not allow a nuclear-capable nuclear Iran would not allow a nuclear capable Iran to emerge. Now, uh, today, uh, President Obama is saying he would not allow a nuclear Iran, meaning a nuclear, um, say, a nuclear weaponized uh, Iran. And that makes a big difference. Still, Israel is on its basic position, or the, uh, current, uh, past, uh, the original position, that it would not like to see Iran hold 
a capacity of, to enrich uranium. And that is going to be troublesome for the nuclear negotiations because at least so far, the interim agreement and the possible long-term uh, comprehensive agreement would allow Iran to enrich uranium under a certain condition for a certain time. And that is one issue that's breaking the uh, discussion. It's very difficult to uh, come to an agreement. The other part of the problem is the uh, extraneous issue that uh, Bill has mentioned is that Israel is a member of the IAEA, but is not a member of the a signatory to the NPT. When a non a non signatory state to the NPT makes fuss about or makes some sort of a uh, allegation or a uh, demand against an NPT state, I think it's totally wrong. I mean, it's it's really wrong to say uh, things like that. I be, I believe this should be a, a line, strict line drawn in between that if it's going to be about the IAEA, it's fine. The uh, Israelis have a right to say that. But if it's going to be about the NPT, it should come amongst the NPT states, from the NPT states, not from the non-NPT member. All right, we're very short on time. Short question, short question. Okay. Uh, very, very short. Mr. Uh, Tanaka, just I want to get back to oil with two small questions. In the first place, Japan, or correct me if I'm wrong, I thought Japan at least was, and I st think this still is, one of the four biggest importers of <laughs> Iranian crude. Nevertheless, nobody uh, brought its imports down as much as Japan. Why is that? And the second place, if uh, once Iranian crude is going to stream again, flow again, sorry, um, some people say that it might affect uh, international oil prices. Do you agree on that? Hmm. Well, um, thank you for your question. Um, the Jap Japan's oil import from Iran. Yes, uh, why did, has, has Japan complied with the demands from the United States? Well, simply because we are quite afraid of what's going to be at stake. Uh, the Japanese businesses and also the Central Bank of Japan and also uh, the Ministry of Finance uh, does not want to see the Bank of Japan being sang placed under sanctions by the uh, U.S. Treasury. And maybe the Chinese or maybe the Indians, and they might have some other calculuses. But uh, for the Japanese, I think it's going to be a, a nightmare if we have to choose either between Iran and uh, the United States, and then that somebody would just stick to the idea that we would like to see uh, the business with uh, the Iranians as usual, uh, business as usual. Uh, the oil prices, well, it might affect the uh, oil um, market, but it's very difficult to uh, state how it's going to affect. Uh, well, I, mean, I could say that it would have sort of a downtrend, uh, it would add to a downtrend um, uh, pressure, but uh, whether it's going to happen or not, it's going to be relevant to other issues and uh, conditions that happens somewhere in Europe or Africa or in uh, Asian states. Siegfried, you're up. Siegfried Needle Freelancer from Germany. Mr. Beeman, just a kind of a clarification. I think you said uh, Iran or never said they want to extinguish Israel. Uh, please you, you repeat said. what you just said, please. I'm sorry. You, you, I think you said uh, Iran sa said it never, it never said it wants to extinguish Israel. But did not Ahmadinejad said, say uh, he wants to extinguish? No, absolutely not. And I'm sorry that the explanation is long, but he did not say that. It is not true. I just want to make that categorically clear. I see if I can do it quickly. In 2005, the last day of Ramadan, in, last Friday in Ramadan, called, is called the Day of Jerusalem, or called the Day of Al-Quds, which is a different kind of idea. In uh, what uh, Pre uh, President Ahmadinejad, in a closed meeting with a, bunch of, with a number of youth, quoted Ayatollah Khomeini from 1978. It was not his own words. It was a quote from Ayatollah Khomeini, a well-known quote from 1978. Roughly translated, the quote says, in the course of time, the occupiers of Jerusalem may disappear. That is the exact translation of that statement. 
and it was it was it was seized on, and it was turned into Iran. Iran, like the government of Iran, uh, is threatening to wipe Israel off the map. It is a lie, and I and it has been used as a a, a piece of propaganda ever since. That is the that is the exact truth about this particular statement, not Ahmadinejad's statement. A quote from Ayatollah Khomeini, a quote that had been around for two decades, and finally, uh, and was was said in a closed meeting, was picked up, mistranslated, and was attributed to the government of Iran, rather than to President Ahmadinejad or Ayatollah Khomeini. The government of Iran has never ever taken this position, and I I want to. Uh, it's a very admit it. This this particular lie is so. Uh, so well known that it has its own page on Wikipedia, and so with all of the documentation. And so I, I urge all of you to go back and uh, go to Wikipedia and uh, and search for "wipe Israel off the map," and you'll see every every single reference and interpretation of this. It is a lie. Well, that was pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me uh, just ask one very short question to both of you, uh, bringing it back to Japan. Uh, is Japan going to do anything, anything, in regard to its Iranian policies that are, is not permitted by the United States? <laughs> or is there, are they so afraid of U.S. policy that they're going to wait until Washington gives them the green light before they do anything. <laughs> I, I cannot speak for the government of Japan. <laughs> I just can't. But I can express a wish, and that is that uh, I, that Japan has been, uh, depending on, on the leadership at various times, Japan has been very forthright and also very clever about expressing independent opinions from that of the United States. You sometimes have to be quite sophisticated to understand that these opinions are at odds with U.S. policy. Uh, so I um, I believe that it is in Japan's interests to not uh, uh, to uh, not succumb uh, to the same kind of political pressures that are being put on the United States government by people who want to see these talks fail. I think that Israel that uh, Israel I'm, I'm think that Japan uh, should. Uh, should definitely, in its own interests, be very uh, clear that they, uh, as I've said in my talk, that that th these uh, talks must succeed. And this is a um, this is a position that I think is quite safe for the Japanese government. It, it, the United States can't say, well, um, uh, that's against U.S. policy, <laughs> because the United States is involved in the negotiations, and presumably the United States wants the negotiations to succeed as well. But lending, uh, lending Japanese support to uh, desire for success of the negotiations will help our help the United States negotiators who are working toward a solution and try to counter some of the other pressures that are uh, being put on the U.S. government by extraneous forces. Mr. Taka, you're closer to the uh, councils of the Japanese government. <laughs> are they going to do anything beyond the line no, that I mean, the United well, States permits? Um, first of all, I would like to say that um, in the past, I think there had been some uh, path that we were able to maneuver in between. Um, but I think that time has passed. And now today that we see in our region here in the Far East or the uh, Northeast Asia, that uh, we ourselves are facing some sort of a uh, say security threats. And we need to say strengthen or to consolidate our uh, alliance with the United States. The politicians are hardly like to are hardly likely to go uh, into any uh, dispute with the Americans or the Washington that uh, would uh, endanger that would be considered uh, as a say betrayal by Washington. So uh, in the 1980s, like the cases like I referred to earlier, uh, when the Japanese foreign minister was shuttling between Iran and Iraq, that was one moment I think we had some sort of a more independent policy from Washington vis-a-vis vis vis Iran. Um, I think that has that is some sort of a um, is now a myth. I'm sorry to say. So the answer is no. <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I do have 
honorary membership for both of these gentlemen. Oh, I'm a member again. Oh, good. Yes, you are. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, that means that uh, when you're passing through Tokyo, as one of uh, the necessary steps of your visit, you must come and enjoy our main bar. I, the, we, uh, we, the club is uh, much improved over you know, 30 years ago, I must say. And so I, I, we did enjoy our lunch today. All right. Naka, you are a resident here in Tokyo, yeah. so we do expect to see a lot of you yeah, here. Yeah, make the best use of it. Oh, yeah, thank you. Right. Okay, thanks. And here are your memberships. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you.